Madeline, for that children's story. And thank you, Michael, for that wonderful musical presentation. For those of you who may not know, Michael is our resident Ben Carson. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we come to you with great expectations. Great expectations because you are our great God. And you have never disappointed us. You have never let us down. And so as I share this message today, I'm offering myself as a vessel of fresh and new into your hands at this very moment. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight so that your purpose, your design purpose, might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because this prayer I pray, and praises for victories I give, in Christ's name, amen. amen. David grew up as the youngest son of Jesse, and a major portion of his life was spent as a shepherd boy. Being the youngest in the family, I'm sure that David was acquainted with being somewhat obscure and maybe even overlooked on more occasions than what he liked. But God does not look at individuals in the same regard as we do. And God knew that David was special. Special not because of who he was, but special because of who he was allowing himself to become. And so God's sweet spirit worked in young David's life, and the working of that divine influence stimulated David with great promises. Not only great promises, but that divine influence also led him into grand ventures. Grand adventures like killing a bear and a lion that tried to devour a lamb of his father's flock. Years after slaying Goliath the giant and being anointed king of Israel, David made this statement of declaration in Psalm 18 and verse 19. He, speaking of God, he brought me forth into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I trust that you noted as I read that verse that David was speaking a testimony. God had actually done this thing for David. And now David could testify with lifted head and with upraised hands of what God had done for him. I want us to back up in this chapter, Psalm 18, and read a few verses that give insight into how thrilling it must have been for David to broadcast this testimony. When I became a Christian at the age of 15, I heard that evangelist Billy Graham had a very unique Bible reading habit. He read through the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs every month. And so I thought to myself, if it's good enough for Billy Graham, it's good enough for me. And so for several years, I followed that practice by reading five psalms and one chapter in the book of Proverbs every day of the month. Now, of course, I had to make reading adjustments in accord with how many days were in each month. 
And I thought about my reading habit many times over the years. And I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions that one of the main reasons why I enjoy praising God, my God as I do, is because of this early practice of reading through the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs every month for years. Might be something that you would like to do for yourself. And well do I remember reading as a young Christian Psalm 18 and verse 19, stopping when I finish reading that verse and asking myself this question. I wonder what it was about David that caused God to delight in him. Whatever it was, I want the same thing operating in my life. And so I backed up to verse number one, and there it was, as plain as could be. Listen closely. David said, talking to God, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Did that get projected? I don't think it did. There it is. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And when I read that, immediately I thought, how could God not take delight in someone who promised? How could God not take delight in someone who vowed to love him? Lately, I've been thinking a lot about this principle. And if I sense in my mind and in my heart If I cannot testify with my lips and with my life that God is taking delight in me, can it be? Can it really be that maybe one of the reasons is that I am not personally telling God that I love him? And that I will love him regardless of circumstances? Could it really be? Now, you don't have to answer this next question out loud, but I do hope that you will meditate upon it and answer it in your own mind and heart. What would every day I live be like if I started out that day saying and meaning by making this vow? I will love thee, O Lord. How long has it been since you said those words to the Lord? I love you, Lord. I will love you, Lord. Regardless of circumstances and and what's going on around about me in my life, I will love you. Now, let's continue reading in Psalm 18. And as we continue reading, I challenge you to find personal joy with the deliverance that David experienced as he was giving testimony concerning God. Look at verse number two. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler. And the horn of my salvation and my high tower. How about verses 3, 4, 5, and 6? I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And so shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me and, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Ever felt like that? The sorrows of hell compassed me about, and and the snares of death prevented or confronted me. And in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. And how about verses 17 and 18? He delivered me 
from my strong enemy. And from them which hated me, for, for they were too strong for me. They prevented or confronted me. In the day of my calamity, the Lord was my stay. Amen. What a wonderful testimony David gave to his generation. And my brothers and sisters, there are those even listening to this sermon today who can give that very same testimony. Will you agree with me that God is the same God today as he was in the yesterday of David? Will you agree with me that God is still able to deliver his children? Will you agree with me that God still takes delight in those who love him? Will you agree with me that God still longs to bring us into a large place in accordance with his word, his will, and his way? Sadly, there are a great many people of today who have an idea that, that to obey God's word, to accept God's will, and to yield to God's way is to come into narrowness. My friends, I say loud and I shout long, such is not the case. You see, the everlasting gospel is an invitation. The everlasting gospel is an invitation for us to enter into the expansive horizon of limitless possibilities. And we can testify loud and long, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, yes. While it's true that at the time of conversion and, and becoming a Christian, we are at that very moment brought into a large place. Unfortunately, many people are content and follow me closely, with living narrow lives in a large place. I refuse to do that. And at this juncture, you may be saying, and I want to anticipate a very natural reaction as you may be thinking, but Pastor Dan, I live in the routine of narrow circumstances. Pastor Dan, you don't understand. I live in a little house in a small town. And Pastor Dan, I basically do the same routine every day. I'm not a David. I'm not anointed by God to be king over a country. And, and I certainly am not talented to play a harp or to write songs like he did. To be sure, not every one of us lives in great scenes, and not all of us are part of great transactions. Our lives may indeed be full of small cares and duties, but we must never we must never, I say it again, we must never allow this to dictate the largeness of our living. You see, what we are, not where we come from. What we are, not what we do as a profession. What we are determines the largeness of life. And just in case no one has told you or reminded you lately, things do not make life large. Some of you will remember a very famous woman a number of years ago who had hundreds of pairs of shoes. She thought that, that things would make her life large, but it wasn't a large life she was living and I am becoming convicted and convinced the older I become that the more things we have, the smaller our 
environment becomes. Because we have a tendency to clutter. Am I smiling? Can you see my teeth? We have a tendency to to clutter the walls and and the mantle and the tables with things. And and when we do that, the walls get smaller and the mantle gets smaller and the table gets smaller, even though it's the very same size. Understand what I'm saying? We can have a large closet, but if we fill it full, the closet seems small. Smaller, doesn't it? And we, what are you patting your wife for? And we want to build a larger closet. Things do not make life large. You see, a person can do large things sometimes in small places, and and other people do small things in large places. History records many examples of how individuals acquainted with obscurity, people acquainted with poverty, people acquainted with pain could voice the very same testimony of David because they learned to live in fellowship with great things, the things of God. Not the things of this earth, because the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. And when we're concentrating on the things of God, that is when our lives take on immense measure. Flowing from personal experience and observation with others, both from the past and from the present, I want to share with you three suggestions that will assist every one of us to be ushered into a large place. Number one, first of all, transform littleness into benefits unlimited by accepting it as a stepping stone. I got to read that again. Transform littleness into benefits by unlimited, by accepting it as a stepping stone. Be a Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was too little. Zacchaeus was too short to see over the crowd to catch a glimpse of Jesus. But he transformed that littleness into a benefit by climbing up a sycamore tree And the sight of him perched on that branch like a little bird surely must have brought a smile to the face of Jesus because Jesus stopped. And he looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. You see, Zacchaeus transformed that littleness into unlimited benefits by accepting his littleness as a stepping stone. Don't use littleness as an excuse. Don't allow it to be a hindrance in your life. You step on it by the grace and power of God and climb a little higher. Secondly, Live the Christian life in the sense of great truths. One of the great truths is that you and I are children of God. We are heirs of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that is exciting to me. That's so exciting to me, I think I'll say a word I haven't said in a few weeks. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By faith in Jesus Christ, you and I are heirs of God. We are joint heirs together of the benefits of the Lord. And every day, every hour, every minute, every second of your life, you need to understand that you are a child of God. 
And as a child of God, you are very dear to God because you are part of God's family. <laughs> I heard this story a number of years ago about a person who went to a very sophisticated church in the new city to where he had relocated. He was met at the door by the usher who looked at him and said, Sir, I believe I do not know you. The visitor smiled and responded, Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, yes, the usher responded. Well, said the visitor, I am a brother of his. <laughs> I like that. We are to live the Christian life in the sense of great truths. Don't ever settle for less than God's great truth for your life. Because to do so will mean you will miss a blessing and the opportunity of being a blessing unto others. Thirdly, be a vital part of Christ's work. The field is the world. And so because the field is the world, don't ever confine yourself to the closetness of idleness. Become passionately involved in the large place of service for Christ. <laughs> Share your time. Share your talent. Share your treasure to the purpose of glorifying God right where you live, and soon the harvest will prove itself to be worthwhile. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration of one of our Little Creek Fellowship members, Dan Bowen. Several months ago, Dan Bowen had a vision to start a scrap metal ministry. And hundreds of dollars have been raised already and that money is being used to assist needy families. But Pastor Dan, it's just a little can. Well, it was a great vision. And because of that great vision, people are being helped. You see, we here at Little Creek Fellowship will never accept that our mission is just for Johnson County. The field is ripe unto harvest, and God has called us to be part of a large work, amen? We are not just a little congregation here, even though our number may be small in comparison with others, but we have a large vision. Because we see the large work. That's why we have literature evangelists. That's why we have vacation Bible school tomorrow. That's why we have all of the ministries that we are promoting here. Is because we realize the field is the world. How vividly the songwriter expressed this point with these words and melody. Little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. Little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. Do you know do you really know with all of your mind and all of your heart that God longs to take special delight in you? He does. And because God longs to take delight in you, God desires to continually lead you step by step by step into a large place. And the next time Satan approaches you with the suggestion that you are insignificant, 
you sink your very soul afresh into the testimony of David. And you claim for yourself what David testified of himself. Look at it. Lord, I love you and will continue to love you and believe that you are bringing me forth into a large place. You are my constant deliverer because you are taking special delight in me. I'm going to ask you to read that out loud with me. Are you ready? Lord, I love you and will continue to love you and believe that you are bringing me forth into a large place. You are my constant deliverer because you are taking special delight in me. Is there anybody else here besides me that wants to say praise the Lord about now? Would you like to say hallelujah about now? <laughs> you and I may never be king over a vast domain as was David. But soon and very soon, if we learn the lessons of living in a large place right down here on this earth as we wait for the glorious return of Jesus, soon and very soon we are going to be transported to a place of infinite room and we will reside with Christ forever in the largest place of all, heaven and the new earth. I want to go there, don't you? I don't want to miss it. And the way we can make sure we don't is to allow God to bring us into a large place right here. Father God, I want to thank you for your willingness to lead all of us into a large place. And Father, I confess with my lips what you know is in my heart. That is my desire. Not so that I can protrude my lapels and, and boast, look at me. But Father, I want to live in a large place so that everyone who looks at me can see you the God who makes it possible. And Father, I am praying for all of my family and all of my friends. I am praying for Little Creek Fellowship. And I am praying for every believer worldwide that soon and very soon we will all be able to resound the same testimony as did David. And Father, I am praying even for those who have not become a part of your family yet. Please use us to be an inspiration that they may seek a large place right where they live. Because as I pray and praise as I give, in the loving name of Jesus, amen.